I'm really excited to dive into the next conversation with Yolanda F. Johnson and Mary Quevedo. Um, so thank you everyone for tuning in today. You'll notice that your camera and audio are off and they will remain off, but please feel free to drop any questions or comments you have in the chat. Um, we wanna make this as engaging as possible. You can find SHRM credits at the top left of the screen to use, and then we're gonna drop a code of conduct um, in the chat to make sure that this is a great experience for everyone. And so um, I am just gonna hand the mic right over to Mary um, so that I don't take up any time with any intros and bios. Uh, so uh, I will hand the mic right over to you, Mary, and uh, thank you so much for being here. And to you as well, Yolanda, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Paolo. Thank you, Nicole, for this introduction. And okay, it's my time to introduce Yolanda. I'm so happy to be with you today. Yolanda F. Johnson is the founder of Woke. I love the pronunciation, by the way. Uh, it is, sorry, Woman of Color in Fundraising and Philanthropy. And you are also the founder of Allies in Action member Membership Network. Let's start with this conversation about telling us about your journey from fine arts to fundraising and philanthropy. Well, um, it's a pleasure to be here today. You can hear me fine, right? Yes. We hear okay, you good, good, good. Um, thanks so much for having me. And my journey, I look at life as something um, that I call crafting a life. And so I really ascribe to the thought of being able to find outlets for all of our talents. I call it my treasure trove of fabulousness. I always tell women that they have that little Mary Poppins bag. They can pull out all these gifts and talents and uh, accomplish all of their dreams and their goals. Um, and I think that we're all so multifaceted. We have so many different uh, gifts and perspectives on life and work um, that we can find a way to weave that ribbon through everything uh, that it is that we want to do eventually. And so for me, um, when I was studying, I, I've always done both ever since my senior year in college, actually. It started because I wanted to make sure that the arts survived from a business perspective and from an administrative perspective. Uh, I'm a lyric soprano. And so I ended up throwing the first School of Music Gala back as an undergraduate before I was even out of college. Um, there was an epidemic of orchestras closing, uh, shutting down because of fiscal mismanagement. You had perhaps musicians who were moonlighting as executive directors who didn't quite understand the financial side of things and what needed to happen to keep the work moving forward. And so um, that impacted me as an artist. And I had a professor who said, well, what are you going to do? I said, well, an opera, you can't really sing to pre-recorded music the same way that you might do in some other forms like dance. Um, and I said, well, I'm going to make sure that as I continue my life as an artist, I'm also going to keep the business side of the arts alive. So that's how it started. And then I fell in love with fundraising and philanthropy, um, just as I was with the arts and I married the two. I started to realize as I progressed through my career when I am sitting in that banking dining room asking somebody for tens of millions of dollars, I'm getting into character just like I'm on stage. Uh, so I called upon all of those performance skills and tied them together. I have workshops that I do that use performance practice for philanthropy. Um, so that's how I brought the two together and I've never not done both. They both had an equal role in my life. If one was missing, there was something missing in my life. And so it never has been a day job sort of situation. I was able to marry passion in a really beautiful way. It is so inspiring. Actually, yesterday I was listening to your music. It's amazing. I, <laughs> you you. Liked I, it. <laughs> I love it. I searched for you on YouTube and your music is amazing. And I had a lot of questions about how you, you came from, uh, how you started your career, like when, it, every, when everything began, how you started, what was first? Performing Lyric Soprano or did you, before did you, did you do some philanthropy work as well? And how this, how this 20 years path that you have as a, of experience turn into what it is right now? I truly have always done both. 
Um, even when I look back to the first event that I did to bring people together and support of something or even socially, I was like a young child. <laughs> I loved doing that. Um, I always have had a, a sort of social justice lens whenever I saw any group that wasn't, um, you know, anything unjust that was happening to any particular group. I've always wanted to have a voice as far as that's concerned. And yet I was always in music. Um, and so I truly have a life, like I can't even escape it. Even the focus areas I noticed, and this was only a few years ago that I realized both in philanthropy and in the arts, I champion women composers. I call them unsung heroines, um, you know, women performers, women of color composers and performers, African-American classical musicians and composers I compose myself. So anyone who hasn't had that opportunity to have their voices heard, when, whenever there's been inequity, that's what I've always championed. And I do the same work um, organically in philanthropy um, most of the time. And so, um, yeah, that, that's been the path of my life. I've crafted that life um, no more beautifully than in the past few years uh, when it really has all come together with my All the World's a Stage workshop um, and digging deeper and diving deeper into philanthropic work. Um, but it's always been there. They've always been side by side. It's just me. And whenever I've tried to deny either one, things were a bit off kilter. So I had to embrace the fact that I do both. And what can you tell us about the mission of women of color in fundraising and philanthropy and also about the mission of allies in action members in network? Well, I happen to be the first African-American president of Women in Development New York. Um, and so that was announced a few years ago. And when I was president elect, uh, one of the things that people noticed sometimes about WID was the lack of diversity. And I, being the first in a New York City chapter of an organization that was four decades old, that really came as a surprise to many people. And so we said, let's look at the pipeline and see if people, you know, if the professionals aren't there, at all and we need to work on pipeline and it is somewhat a pipeline issue but um, is it just an inclusivity issue where they are there but they don't come because they don't feel included they don't feel welcome necessarily and so we worked on lots of different things because WID is an incredible organization. Um, I learned a lot through a two-year diversity and inclusion task force that I launched in 2018. It culminated last summer when the whole racial equity movement was really kicking off. Um, and so I created something called diversity, equity, and inclusion from the inside out. And we moved that initiative forward. Um, it's one of my workshops now. And uh, what I learned from that is that change takes time, but you have to keep on moving. And the voice of the women of color had reached fever pitch to say we need a space for the unique experience of being women of color in the philanthropic space. And so I created it. I created it in the middle of a pandemic. I didn't know what to expect. And wow. here we are now, not even a year old, with more than a thousand members in four countries and continuing to move forward and grow. Now, at that same time last summer, I did not create Woke as an answer to the racial equity movement. It was already happening. It's just, it sort of rode that momentous wave um, of the energy behind the movement. But I also was getting lots of calls from non-people of color, literally saying, Yolanda, what do I do? Um, I want to do better. I want to find a place, a role, a voice in this work of what I call IED because inclusion is the most important thing. You can have all the diversity in the world and if people do not feel included, it's all for naught. So that's the starting point for me and all the DEI and IED work that I do. Um, and so I was talking to people and I was, like, um, what city are you in? What's going on in that city? What organizations can you get involved with? How can you contribute? What are your gifts and talents? And that was just not sustainable. And so I got together with a friend of mine who had happened to be part of the Obama administration. She's a racial sensitivity expert. And we brainstormed and I came up with something called Allies in Action. It's based upon four pillars of education, legislation, inclusion, and action. And the action pillar includes philanthropy, uh, we did a big give last at the end of 2020, year in giving last year uh, to women and girls of color. And so um, that's how both of these came to fruition. Wow, it's wonderful. And how is Woke supporting women of color? How are you bringing this woman into the fundraising and philanthropy work? Well, 
we're providing a space for community. Um, I've been in tears many times when people have said, you know, with the whole WID situation, they were like, I finally see someone who looks like me at the helm. And with Woke, it's just been, I needed this space to come together with different women of color. Um, because, you know, even within the women of color community, there's work to be done uh, with solidarity and allyship and standing together with each other, even with our different groups. So it's there for that. It provides encouragement, career advice. We have an amazing career assessment that's on the website. We have a resource library that I decided to take behind the mem from behind the member wall and just put it out there to the whole universe because we're so proud of it and it has so much good information. Um, we have a leadership institute we just launched in January, a 26 member cohort where all of those women are going to be placed on a one year board fellowship um, to diversify leadership in the nonprofit sector. We have sessions on philanthropy. We also exist to, dis to dismantle the archetype of what a philanthropist has been defined to be, especially in America. So gone are the days of the archetype being the affluent white male or female we do love to work with those people who are allies, but we want every single woman of color to remember that she can be a philanthropist. Her name does not have to, have to be Carnegie and on a wall of a building or outside of a wing of a hospital. That's great if you can do that, but we're trying to redefine philanthropy. You know, the real definition of it is, is the love of mankind and how can you intertwine your faith and your identity and the legacy you want to leave um, and the work you want to do now into your philanthropy. So that's the work that we're doing. We have some exciting things coming up around that as well. All of the things you say, lead me to two questions. First, how do we access the resource library you were talking about? Is it like uh, available to the audience or how do we get access to that? Yes, go to can I put it? No, they're not on here on Zoom with us. Okay, go to um, our website, which is uh, WOKEFP, so www.woc-fp.com, and then just peruse, and you'll see the resource library, and go look through there. We have some great articles from Catalyst, you know, that's uh, the organization workplaces that work for women on emotional tax. We have things on women's philanthropy. We have some foremost experts who have some writings on there and articles from different financial institutions. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a good place to go and to look. Perfect. We will write it in the chat before or we will share it with the participants so they can also okay. attend there and see everything. And also what you were saying, lead me to, this, to the question, how has philanthropy evolved through time since 20 years ago when you started until now, where like you say, philanthropy now is not looking as it used to be, that it was uh, mainly dominated by a, a specific, uh, I, I don't know, a specific like people. And now we are making it more inclusive. How have, philanthropy and fundraising evolve during these 20 years of experience you have? Well, I've certainly seen the room change. I've seen meetings change. I see different types of people there. And I think that's the way that it should be. Um, I think that philanthropy has changed because also you have entities like the Women's Philanthropy Institute and Indiana University, uh, which is a, very much a friend of mine and of Woke and of WID. Um, and the, the director there is on our Woke Advisory Committee and she's about to present a special session on you. It's called You Are a Philanthropist um, to the point of everything that we said. So I think that breaking things out and taking a closer look and doing the analysis at uh, redefining philanthropy and really the realities of what was happening in philanthropy because donors of color have always been there. It's just the way that philanthropy had been defined, you know, it could be through people giving to communities and giving to churches and giving in different methods that weren't necessarily a family foundation. So recognizing all of those different ways of giving, empowering people to define themselves through their philanthropy, um, not making assumptions about any different particular type of donor that just because you are manifestly so, or there's some aspect to your life or your work um, that you're definitely gonna be the person to ask for a particular thing, but getting to know donors um, and beginning to know how to involve them um, in philanthropy 
and in good work. And I have a quote that I love to say, I've even put it on t-shirts and, and mugs, um, but I believe it. And it's that the people in fundraising and philanthropy are, are beacons of light and hope who are illuminating the path to the good work that needs to be done. So I think everybody should be, be proud of that. Now we know more about women. You know, Women Give, the report comes out every year. Uh, this year was really interesting. It was about how couples give and the, the trends and patterns for women in their philanthropy. Uh, they have a dip, we have a different way of giving you know, in certain ways. Um, so just to understand that about all the different types of donors and to create those opportunities for them to find ways that are meaningful, meaningful for them to be able to give back. I've seen that happen a lot in the 20 years. I actually, that, that quote you, you say, I read it on your website and it was beautiful. I had it as part of a question for almost the end of the interview, but I'm glad that you already mentioned it. And also I wanted to ask, what are some of the challenges that nonprofit organizations run by people, a woman of color face today? Well, um, as we've done the work and as the work continues to diversify philanthropy, the other thing that has to go hand in hand with that is uh, organizational leadership the pipeline of leadership for fundraisers and leaders and executives of color, but also for board members of color. So when you diversify that boardroom, it's going to trickle down um, throughout, and let's not even say down, um, it'll trickle throughout the organization in a, a really meaningful way. Um, so you can't just stop it's all, it's a cumulative approach, right? Uh, one informs the other and it has to be all hands on deck to make this happen. And so I think that for people of color led organizations and women of color led organizations, just for them to be able to have that support in community places like Woke, um, I think is important because they're, you know, you have to recognize and acknowledge some of the, the challenges that come along with that because of the society in which we live. When you don't acknowledge those things. The realities of the situation is where you really get into trouble. You have to acknowledge it first so that you can deal with it and find a solution for it. And so I think that, uh, you know, there's a certain level of trust that still has to be built and maintained as far as institutional philanthropy is concerned. Um, because, you know, quite often people of color led organizations um, get get locked out of that process a lot of the time. Uh, there's been a bit of an ivory tower where people have to reach back and down, lift as they climb, and you know, put that lens of, of looking out there to see who's doing all of this good work and making sure um, that we're trying to diversify all of the tables of leadership to make those seats at the table. Um, but I think, you know, having that support, having diverse leadership bodies are some of the steps that, that can be taken to help with that. Perfect. And another question we had is, how have your background as a, as a performer helped you become a fundraising expert? And also how did the, your workshop, All of the World's Estate, Estate helps women or people also be part of the fundraising world? So my performance background certainly informs my philanthropy. It informs everything that I do uh, just because I am acutely aware of some of the benefits of breathing. You know, normal, in the normal world, we don't breathe like we should. It has a different impact on people whenever they're meeting with you or if you're presenting to them. Um, so just, there are lots of different things to performance practice that I bring into the philanthropic world, really tips and tools. And that's what I put into all the world's a stage, uh, just really being able to use those to the advantage of those that are trying to, to raise the dollars or give the dollars um, for, for the good work. And then what was the other part of your question? I'm sorry. About your uh, workshop, it is called All, of, all, all the, the World's, world's a stage. stage. Yes. Yes, all the world's a stage and all the world's a virtual stage. Um, and so bringing it into the virtual realm. Um, I love it. It's the, it's the convergence of my worlds, right? It's being able to help people uh, with preparation. We go through things with Alexander Technique, uh, which is a performance practice um, that changes how you even go throughout your daily routines in life, um, how to pivot. Uh, so yeah, lots of different tips and tools and things and skills that, that you can bring to from the performance world. I mean, really all the world is a stage. It really is. 
Uh, you've got a, a stage backdrop behind you with your Zoom background. And I love this tree. I just have to always make sure it doesn't look like it's coming out of my head. But, <laughs> you know, all these things matter whenever we're talking to people and communicating. And, um, and so I just love to help people uh, through that process. Oh, we also have some questions from the chat. So I'm gonna ask them right now. What's, your, what's been your biggest source of inspiration or the thing that keeps you logging in each, each day? My biggest source of inspiration is that I sit in absolute gratitude for the opportunity to lead all of the amazing women that I do and to be able um, to help in whatever way I can and also to um, help the communities that I lead to identify some of the issues and challenges that are at play um, so that we can tackle them and come up with solutions for them and real solutions. I am a dreamer. I'm a pragmatic optimist. Um, I'm a dreamer that likes to put things into action. Um, and so I have to catch myself on that sometimes that, you know, I'm, I'm inspired by the people around me. I'm inspired by my faith. Also these things, you know, conversion are very important for me to help things move forward. And another question we have from the chat, from the chat is how can we women of color start working in fundraising and philanthropy, especially coming from a different field of expertise? Well, good news for you because there are a whole lot of people, I mean, COVID has really created this interesting environment everywhere, right? People are reevaluating their lives and they're going back to what I said at the beginning of crafting a life. What is it that I want to be doing? What legacy do I want to leave? What do I want to even experiment with professionally in my life and how do I do that? And so we see people leaving the nonprofit and philanthropic realm going into the corporate world. We see the opposite happening as well. So I think that, you know, there are lots of different access points and entry points that you might um, consider. First of all, educate yourself and get involved with the community. Uh, if you're interested in being a part of this, find the, the commonalities between what you're doing now, because you're going to need to be able to explain that on a resume and in interviews and conversations, exploratory conversations. If you're starting from something completely and utterly polar opposite, you're going to have a little bit more work to do. But I bet that if you do that analysis, you're going to see um, some of the, the points, you know, where you can connect those dots between where it is that you want to be, what you want to be doing, and where you are right now. Get involved in a community educate yourself. The other thing people need to understand about fundraising and philanthropy today is that, you know, there are lots of different academic programs, graduate programs, doctoral programs. We study this as a science. Um, it went from being something that was kind of haphazard in the early 80s to a very, very real thing that people, there's a danger in thinking that, oh, I can just go do that in the nonprofit realm. You have to respect the craft and understand that uh, there are a lot of people who who know a lot about it now. So you just have to educate yourself, get a community and be really honest, do that self-assessment of where you are now, where you wanna be and how you get there. Perfect. We don't have much time yet. So I want you to talk to us about your singing career, about your album and where can we hear your music? Oh, you can hear me on YouTube and Amazon and everywhere that music is sold. I think you can find, I, I specialize in spirituals and the Underground Railroad. Um, my website's under construction, so that'll be back up soon with some other clips about women composers and just regular opera that I've done. Um, but yeah, COVID's been a weird time for music. <laughs> so, um, but, but we shall reemerge and do more. I just got an offer today to do a, an outdoor summer festival this summer. I don't know if I'll do it. We'll see if everybody wears their masks, but <laughs> um, yeah. So you can just, you can find me online. Stay in touch. <laughs> One more question. I don't know if you can answer it with so little time, but I want to ask, how do you balance your different facets? How, how do you do with your time? Like, how do you go from working on, in Woke, also being the president of YFJ Consulting, and being an active leader soprano? I'm very efficient, and um, I love to be able to focus on a different thing at a different time. So with my consulting practice, it has four pillars. We do IED work, DEI work, um, philanthropic counsel. So if you have funds that you want to give and you want to figure out how you want to give out that money and establish your legacy, we help coach philanthropists as far as that's concerned. We do fundraising strategy and we do events. 
And so then I've got the music and the other things that I do. I would be remiss if I did not give my team. I know some of them are on right now. <laughs> I would not be able to do any of it without the incredible women on my team. Um, so I love you all. I appreciate you all. And I thank you all. Um, so really it's having a great team that you can trust of talented people who are around you and being efficient and knowing that you can't do everything at the same time. So you have to prioritize and, uh, and pace yourself to know what's coming when so that you can be present and enjoy all that you're doing. Amazing. Can, can you give us one piece of advice to encourage us to do more fundraising and philanthropy work? Um, think honestly about, you mean from a personal perspective? Yes, exactly. Yes. What, what matters to you? Think about what matters to you and look at what you have to give and find the ways that resonate with you and that are meaningful for you. And it doesn't have to be thousands of dollars, just whatever it is. And even when it doesn't come to dollars, think about your time, think about uh, your talents that can be contributed to an organization or an effort that really translate to, to helping the bottom line. Uh, you know, they may not have to hire a different consultant or a person to do something because they have you there as a volunteer. But think about who you are and how you want to live out that good work. How can you help the greater good? And then just start from there. Do some Googling to try to figure out what that means. Perfect. Thank you so much for your time. And please tell, tell us where we can find you. And thank you so much for this conversation. Thank you. You can find me at wokefp.com and you can find me at yfj-consulting.com or yolandafjohnson.com. I live in three different places on the internet, but they all connect with each other. Perfect. Thank you so much, Yolanda. It's been amazing talking to you. Thank you for having me.